you can do osteotomies for ACL and uh, medial compartment arthritis, but there's also prescribed techniques for PCL, insula, and also posterolateral. Um, just, um, I think we've already been over the anatomy a little bit, but um, according to Buckholder, the, nat the natural slope of the knee is about nine degrees of posterior slope, and when you start to mess with that in a, a natural knee, that's when you can actually cause instability as well. <coughs> um, The, um, the anterior translation of the tibia from its neutral position is maximal at about 30 degrees of flexion and that's when the anterior strength is most lax, which is why we do uh, lockments at 30 degrees. And then for the tibia, um, the posterior translation is greatest at about 90 degrees of flexion when the posterior structures are most lax, which is why we do that posterior draws uh, test at 90 degrees as well. Um, the ACE stops uh, posterior translation of the femur forwards and the PCL stops the femur uh, going backwards, which is the reasoning behind uh, doing osteotomies for uh, instability. <coughs> the video doesn't work, but this is Menzel uh, getting taken out uh, from, I think it was Paul Polo, which was a, uh, he just got up and walked off, which was pretty disappointing, but un not unexpected for Hawthorne. So, uh, HTO. <laughs> HTO uh, is well described, uh, well described in the literature for isolated compartment uh, arthritis. Um, this is a paper that was uh, in International Orthopaedics uh, by Amendola. It's quite a good article, um, just for some general reading on the role of HTO. Um, we're certainly taught that instability is a contraindication for high tibia osteotomy for uh, isolated compartment uh, arthritis. However, um, and certainly there's there's opportunity to stuff it. So this was a case report um, described in 2009 uh, for a failed HTO. Um, and you, you can't quite see it. The X-ray on the left was post-primary uh, HTO. And they, the authors described that slope as being about 20 degrees. Um, and I think that's when the patient was in full flexion. And then they had to, and the patient presented with instability, and they had to correct the slope back up to its neutral uh, 90 degrees. So there's certainly a lot of option, opportunity to stuff it up. Um, in my experience, I'm always taught to focus on the correction in the coronal plane, less focus on a uh, spatial plane deformity. Uh, noise in, in 2000 was a bit of a guru. Um, I think it's um, this paper from 2000 uh, classifies various uh, abnormal uh, various malalignment into three stages: uh, primary varus, which is essentially a bony malalignment, and then what he described as a double varus, which is bony malalignment and instability of the lateral ligamentous structures. He then described uh, triple varus as when the patient has bony lateral ligamentous and then tibial rotation and hyperextension uh, as part of their condition. Um, and his argument was that for the bony malalignment you address uh, the bony factors, but then when they go on to double and triple varus, that's when you start to have to address Oh, that's, and that's sort of there, that's pretty busy, but that's what, if you have this, you can, yeah. Um, it's well documented that ACL rupture disrupts uh, knee biomechanics. There's a few saving graces, in particular the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. You can see as the femur slides backwards, it kind of gets caught um, by the medial meniscus. So you can imagine there's a couple of biomechanical studies if you increase the slope, you kind of act as a an extra buffer to that medial meniscus, especially in a lot of these patients, that, that was long gone. Um, and I guess the question is, uh, can osteotomy uh, aid biomechanics in an ACL uh, deficient knee? And these are some examples of changing uh, the posterior slope to try to address that. Just while you're there, what do you want to know? Go back to that slide. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, so patella bar. Patella femoral um, joint biomechanics in relation to osteotomy is another massive talk which I've left out because I'll be here for another couple of hours. Um, the next question is can uh, osteotomy aid biomechanics in a PCL uh, deficient knee? There's no, uh, no uh, the clinical studies, but certainly in cadaver models. Uh, so uh, this was done by Giffen in 2007. So they got a hold of the cadaver knees and uh, aged, uh, just 
just their normal needs. These after they cut the peak deal. And you can see, uh, see the, the relation of the tibia to the femur. And then these after they've done uh, an osteotomy to try to correct that. So it's kind of blocking the femur sliding forward. Um, so then moving on to osteotomy for uh, ACL deficient knees. Again, this is the first uh, sort of real study looking looking at osteotomy for ACL deficiency. They looked at 41 double and triple varus knees, which are the ones with either lateral ligamentous instability or lateral combined external rotation. Um, and they did a staged closing wedge osteotomy and then went on to perform an ACL reconstruction as a staged procedure. Um, they noticed a reduction in pain in 71% of people, reduction of doing weight in 85% of people just after the initial uh, osteotomy uh, for instability. Um, looking at uh, posterior lateral corner deficient knees, this is done by ARCA. They um, had 21 patients with a chronic uh, isolated posterior lateral corner deficiency and they did tibial opening wedge osteotomy. And then, if needed, went on to do a second phase ligamentous reconstruction. Um, Sorry, it wasn't for isolated. They had six isolated posterior lateral corner patients and only two had to go on and have ligamentous stability post osteotomy. Um, and then they had 15 with multi ligamentous injuries. Ten of those had to go on and have uh, ligamentous <coughs> um, This is a big by uh, Amandola in, that was published in 2004. Uh, he had 17 knees uh, that he performed opening wedge osteotomy for people that had a hyperextension varus thrust uh, just as for their gait, plus or minus ligamentous. Uh, um, and that was the, um, the correction that uh, he's described. Um, and nine patients reported as being better and 7% reported themselves as being uh, somewhat better. So, no, and there was one that wasn't happy with their surgery. Um, I think the question is, do you perform it as a staged uh, procedure, particularly what you're talking about with ACL and medial compartment arthritis on? If you do, you know, do you do it all at once and just get out of the way, or do you do your HTL and then decide if they do on go on to to net require ligamentous reconstruction? Um, uh, noise is a real advocator for initial HTO and then do the, the ligamentous stage procedure. Um, Hickson um, prefers to that's it all together, so combine HTO with, with ligamentous reconstruction, um, but does report risk of after fibrosis, non union, and if you stuff up your null alignment to start with, then you're going to stretch the graft, the graft will fail. Um, uh, and there's no real answer that I could find uh, in the literature for that. So, uh, in summary, osteo, uh, uh, sorry, osteo for instability is a new procedure. Um, what I've got from reading all about this is you need to respect the bony canal line and if you look at chronic ACL deficient knees, we've seen a couple of instructions on and then you go back and you have a look at the slope and the, the, the slope in this phase of the plane is a lot of whack and that was never um, contemplated as part of the surgery. So I think if you don't respect the canal line in the sagittal plane in chronic ligament instability, so, um, I think that's something that I'm always going to look for uh, from doing all this. There's, lot, there's lots of new sort of evidence coming out in Angola. <coughs>